don't you start? Why don't you start it right? When I start, start it right. right? Yeah. Here. Hello. What? Wait. Wait. Three, two, one. Hello, and welcome to the Voice of Design. There it is. That's better. Oh, thanks. Thanks. It's important to have your approval. Uh, hello, and welcome to the Voice of Design. I'm Erica Hall. <laughs> This is Mike again. Mike again. And we're coming to you from our glorious downtown North Beach bunker. And it's really hot out there. So I'm really excited we have the bunker today. And with us today, we have a very special guest. A returning member of the Mule family. A returning member who's gone on to do some amazing things that that I'm excited to talk about today. Uh, We have John Hanawalt. Hi. The co-founder. Co-founder. Co-founder of Queer Design Club. Correct. Can we talk about where you work now? Yeah, yeah. It's It's official. Stitch Fix. Yeah, I'm a a lead product designer at Stitch Fix on their design systems team. That's wonderful. I love it. They're great. Good. They're lucky to have you. Anyway, I want to talk about Queer Design Club. I do too. Because you started that. How long? Give me the history of Queer Design Club. Well, it might help to start with uh, what Queer Design Club is. Um, And then double back to how we got here. Uh, Queer Design Club is a community all about celebrating and supporting LGBTQ designers uh, and people in design, project managers, front end developers and whatnot. That sounds good. How do you support them? Uh, Well, we have a few ways that we uh, have sort of built this community, one of which is a Slack group where members can come and talk about what they're dealing with at work, get professional advice share inspiration, share fun queer history facts. Uh, And then we also have an online directory at queerdesign.club of LGBTQ designers. Uh, So if you're looking for someone in the design industry, an illustrator, typographer, speaker, uh, you can go to our website and find someone from the queer community who matches that bill. Let's define design here for a little bit. Are we talking just interaction design, web stuff, or to go beyond that? No, we're we're uh, very open. One of the things that my co-founder uh, Bex and I decided early on in creating Queer Design Club is that we weren't interested in two things. We aren't interested in uh, debating who's a designer, and we're not interested in debating who's queer. Oh my God! Uh, bless <laughs> you, bless you, John. You're you're bringing world peace. Yeah, we're not going to police those two things. Uh, our general point of view is: you know, if you belong in this community, if those labels are right for you. That sounds amazing. Uh, tell me about your co-founder. How did you two meet? Through Twitter. It's it's one of the few good things to come out of Twitter uh, in my life recently. It started for me, actually, at a mule salon. I was uh, enjoying the community of designers and lively conversation and the free alcohol. And um, this idea that had been percolating in my head of finding a way to connect designers in the queer community uh, to sort of came to a boil, you know, and I was like, fuck it, I'm doing it. And so I got on Twitter, I I registered a handle and I tweeted out, follow me. I want to do this. I don't know what it's going to look like, but we're going to do something great together. And the very next day, Bex, uh, who's a designer based in Buenos Aires, uh, tweeted at me that she had a similar idea. And uh, so we just, we uh, did a Google Hangout we talked about uh, what we wanted to build respectively, and it was basically the same thing. And so we've been collaborating remotely now for about four or five months. So you two just joined forces. Yeah. You didn't know her before this. No. Her? Yes. You didn't know her before this. Have nope. you met now? Yeah, she was actually uh, out uh, in San Francisco on her way to XOXO. She did a little... Uh, space for queer people of color at the XOXO conference. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So she stopped over on her way. John, I'm going to ask what I see might be an obvious question, but I think it's still worth going into a little bit. Why do we need a queer design club? Sure. I, so I think for me, the genesis of queer design club comes from, from two places. One is uh, really selfish and one is maybe a little bit more altruistic. I think they're both really big motivators for me. But the first is, you know, as a queer designer, I've really sort of struggled to figure out where I fit in in the profession uh, because the design profession, especially when you work in tech, can be very straight, uh, very traditional. And uh, 
it can be hard to uh, fit in and and find uh, sort of professional peers in that sort of environment when you're used to hanging out with queer folks. The other reason is that I was getting a lot of people reaching out to me, you know, through Twitter or through email to thank me for just being visible and be, being outspoken about the issues that queer designers face, you know, around diversity and inclusion and accessibility into the industry. And, you know, that really told me that there was a need for people who um, are newer to the industry, who don't feel as well connected, who don't feel like they have the privilege to be as outspoken as I am. And so I see this as an opportunity to use my position as an established designer with you know, a strong network and a strong sense of self and, uh, you know, willing to burn everything to the ground if need be, you know, to do some work for, for people who are a little bit more vulnerable. The queer community is really diverse, you know, so I am a cis white gay man making SF tech money, but my experience is really different from that of a trans designer of color in the Midwest. You know, they don't have the same resources. Maybe they're dealing with other bits of adversity related to race or gender. And so this is an opportunity, I think, for the queer community to come together and really be allies to each other. And this is obviously a worldwide effort. I mean, you've got a co-founder in Buenos Aires. So, I mean, we, we I mean, you mentioned that, you know, you're you're in a privileged position and and you're you're using it, which is fantastic. But we're and we're here in this bubble of San Francisco. I mean, there's places out there in the world. I mean, I'll phrase it as a question: Are there people who still have to hide? Yeah, absolutely. There are queer people everywhere, and design is increasingly a global profession. I work with people in the UK. I've worked with people in Mexico or Asian projects. And so being a digital first community really allows us to be welcoming and inclusive and not limit the definition of who is our peer uh, and who belongs with us. And that's one of the things that's still kind of magical about the internet. So a couple of days ago, you mentioned online that you're doing a survey. Yeah. Tell me about the survey. Sure. So. Uh, we just launched the Queer Design Count, and it is a fieldwide survey of LGBTQ designers all over the world and people in design, uh, even if you don't identify as a designer per se. And that came out of uh, looking at the data from the AIGA design census. So AIGA already does an industry-wide survey where they ask about uh, income, job satisfaction, company size, uh, and all that sort of stuff. And they ask about LGBTQ status, but it's a single checkbox. Do you identify as LGBTQ? Yes or no? I saw that they collected this data. They make it public, which is amazing. And so I dug into it a little bit. The first thing that's really interesting is that 15% of their respondents identified as LGBTQ. That's almost three times the national estimate right now. And when you dig into their responses, you can see that they tend to earn a little less. They're not as senior. They're not as satisfied. Uh, their sense of job stability is, is a little more insecure. And uh, that's all we know because that's it's a it. yes that's or no question, they... right? And everything else is about their experience as a designer. And for me, I think there's a huge wealth of information there to be tapped, a lot of questions that need to be asked around your experience as a queer designer and figuring out uh, what it is about that that leads to those disparate outcomes in satisfaction and happiness and security. And so that's why we launched The Count. Uh, it's a survey that asks a lot of the same questions as the AIGA design census, you know, income, satisfaction, how long you've been at your company, but then asks, how open are you about your gender and identity at work? How receptive have, have your coworkers been? You know, what have you experienced on the job? Have you been asked to work for anti-LGBTQ clients? Or, you know, have you worked with 
coworkers who have misgendered you or made assumptions based on your sexual orientation. So we can start to fill in the gaps in the story behind those numbers. Do you know what you're going to do with that information once you have it? Well, we, we have I mean, to... Step one is learning, obviously. Yeah, yeah we have to, um, you know, see what there is to, to learn first. But, you know, we want to share it. We want to be really loud and vocal with it. Uh, I think one of the things that we want to do is uh, create a white paper for companies, actually, who want to be inclusive, who oh, want to be diverse. That um, sounds good. And tell them what we learned. I think uh, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, people would do if they just knew. They just haven't considered it. Uh, so we want to give them some some easy ways to be more inclusive. And we want to start a conversation about where is the place for the queer community in the conversation around diversity and inclusion? Mm-hmm. How much, and I don't know if you know this, but I'll ask it anyway. How much do you think what's going on out there? Uh, you mentioned lower pay, not advancing as high as non-LGBT people. How much of that do you think is ignorance, which is not okay, uh, versus malice? I don't know that you can quantify the difference between ignorance and malice because in part, any sufficient amount of ignorance is indistinguishable from malice, right? So there's no excuse. There, There's no excuse. I'm, I mean, we are in 2019. Queer people are on the internet. They are having open dialogues about their experiences. We have done a lot of the work for you if you want to go and learn uh, and if you can listen. And so I think um, one of my roles here is to do that listening and consolidate it in a way that will make sense to the people that need to hear it and bring it to their doorstep. Um, Because a lot of them aren't doing that very simple act of of listening. This is such critical work because... You know, I, I've lived in in San Francisco for a long time, and San Francisco has this reputation of being, you know, a, a fantastic, welcoming, queer city. And I think, with the what what's the right word ascendancy of this current wave of the tech industry, it is like a super straight the, white the bro. douche the douchening the the douchening the yeah. douchening the douchoisie and Clara Jeffrey the uh, the editor in chief of Mother Jones tweeted the other day that like the conversations in San Francisco are so boring like every conversation she overhears they really are and we're because of we've sort of been subsumed by Silicon Valley we're kind of like setting the agenda for the future and so I think it's really important that um that you are creating space for these voices and yourself you know being so outspoken because i think what you said about modeling for people like saying stuff like being a successful designer and also being willing to uh to be very outspoken and to be who you are without apology i think unapologetic is probably uh, a john hanawalt uh, brand attribute i would say and it's a beautiful thing have you met wendy <laughs> Wendy is my mother. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, which Wendy? Oh, yeah, Wendy. And I know she's going to listen to this, so I want to make sure that we talk about her. Hi, Mom. Because Wendy is a firebrand. Yeah, her catchphrase is, fuck you, I'm old. That's a good one. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, no, my my mother uh, has been a huge advocate for the community even before I came out. Uh, she came out for me, uh, to me, multiple times, like, John, you're gay. It's okay, but you're gay. <laughs> Not in those exact words. Um, I'm picturing, like, did she put a note in like your lunchbox at school? Well, it was. I love my gay son. Yeah, it was. It was more things like in the car. You know, if there's anything you ever need to tell me, I'll love you anyway. She used to actually say, "I'll love you no matter what. Just don't tell me you're an axe murderer or you're a woman trapped in a man's body." And this was the '80s. And about five years ago, she came to me and said, I need to apologize to you because I should have never said, uh, I will love you. Just don't tell me you're a woman traps in a man's body. She remembered that? She did. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, you know, this was 
the Phil Donahue years when she was saying that, and she's learned so much. She's remained really open to all members of the queer community. And, you know, she apologized to me for what that could have done. And, you know, she said, I'd love you even if you were an ax murderer. Uh, so uh, she's been a really wonderful influence. And uh, I think it's because I have family like that, that I feel like I can go out and, and be myself and, and start trouble without worrying about if I'll be supported or not. Yeah. So that, that's fantastic that you're now providing that sort of support or or facilitating, I'd say facilitating people supporting each other who still in 2019 don't have that necessarily from, from their parents or from their professional community where they are. Yeah. And I, I, I think that to some extent there's a, uh, a bit of doing it on on behalf of people who feel like they don't have the voice or they don't have the space in their career to do it. And then there's modeling it for people who really do mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. just aren't. And I think that that's something that I've struggled with a lot as, you know, again, a cis white gay guy. It's really tempting to let yourself be tokenized and accept that seat at the table when you do mm -hmm. that. And then not make waves, you know? Yeah. You know, the fact of the matter is that, yes, I represent one type of diversity, but uh, not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. And so I've got my seat at the table and it's time to throw elbows until mm -hmm. there are a few more seats open. Yeah. Fantastic. Hey, before we move off the count completely, you've got a deadline for this, right? Yes, November 30th. November 30th. And where can people go fill it out? queerdesign.club slash count. Yeah, and we'll make sure to have that link in in the show notes. Cool. November 30th. Yes. Let's let's fill that out. Uh your your all of that information remains private, right? It is completely anonymous. So you have no reason not to fill it out. It is going to be in trustworthy hands. And uh just like with Queer Design Club itself. We are not policing who is in design and who is queer. So if you feel like uh, those identities speak to you, we want to hear from you and about your experience, uh, whether you are a working designer or a student or someone who's just really passionate and does it uh, recreationally. I think that uh, your perspective is going to be valuable and valid, and I can't wait to get it. So you mentioned <clears throat> that you're not policing queerness. No. Let's talk about who is. <laughs> who isn't? So I saw this tweet earlier and um, I saw a bunch of replies to it and I, I cheated. I, I texted John during lunch and I said, can we talk about this on the show? Mm -hmm. LGB Alliance. Right. So I'll read the tweet. This is an historic moment for the lesbian, gay and bisexual movement. LGB Alliance launched in London tonight, and we mean business. Spread the word. Gender extremism is about to meet its match. That seems like a cell phone. Um, there's a at least one letter missing. Yeah. From LGB Alliance. Yeah, so they are looking to separate the T. Uh they want to exclude the transgender, non-binary, gender non-conforming community from the queer community at large. And do you know who they is? Are we familiar with these people? Because you all know each other, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're in the Slack. They're not absolute. They're absolutely not in the Slack. <laughs> if anyone uh, in the Slack tried to suggest separating T from LGBT, they would be banned immediately. Um, this is a new group. Uh, but it is not, unfortunately, an uncommon uh, position right now. So there's TERFs, which is trans exclusionary radical feminists. There are cis white gay guys who who are transphobic. You know, being queer doesn't automatically make you empathetic or a good person. Oh, My television has lied to me. I know. Wow. I also am just really bad at floral arrangements. Uh, <laughs> I can't dance. It's it's a real shame. Um, 
No, it's it's still hard work to be a good person. And a lot of people actually put that effort into being a shitty person. So TERFs are a thing. This yeah. The big thing. Yeah. Yeah. So there are people who feel that the trans community is a separate issue. Um, but really, that's just a cover for the fact that they're hateful bigots. It's a fuck you, I got mine attitude that's no different from any other type of progressive politics. So inclusion means inclusion. Yeah. Words mean words. Yeah, exactly. I think that if you're if you are saying that it is wrong to discriminate against you on the basis of your sex or your gender while or, doing it to somebody else. Right. It's it's ludicrous. It's ridiculous. So the person who tweeted this is Allison Bailey. Which I don't know. I don't know either. May we never learn that much about her. Like, I hope that one day what she represents is a finished conversation that we've all forgotten. And, yeah, and I'm not saying this to shame her, by the way. Uh, but, and I mean, she's getting dragged a lot. But I mean, when she talks about you know, what gets me is the end of this with uh, gender extremism is about to meet its match. She says that. Right. While practicing the same thing. Yeah. Gender extremism is saying that what's between your legs should dictate how you see yourself as a human being. I can't believe that uh, a person who identifies as lesbian, bisexual, or gay needs to be told the difference between sex, gender, and sexuality, and yet here they are pretending not to know just so they I, can advance this agenda. I don't care what's behind what people choose to put in front of me. If they tell me they're a thing, then they're a thing. I'm not going to do a check. Right. I mean, you mentioned what, what, what your mom said to you in the 80s. Yeah. And I mean, I, I guarantee that I said some horrible shit in the 80s and probably in the 90s and maybe even as early as last year. There's been a lot of growing along these lines for a lot of people. And I think the thing to focus on is where people are now and the path they took to get there, not where they were, you know, in the 80s. Yeah, I think growth is really important to acknowledge and it's really important to stay open to the possibility of growth. I also think that it's really important that if before your growth, you cause people harm, that you take responsibility. Oh, absolutely. For that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, I think that's uh, really at the heart of these public draggings is not some sort of vicious mob mentality, but uh, just really wanting to hold people accountable for the harm that they're causing uh, and and tr trying to um, get them to take responsibility for their their impact in the world. A lot of people say, you know, especially when the thing that they're being called out for is something that they said on Twitter. It's, it's just the Internet. It's just, you mm -hmm. know, it's just Twitter. But the fact of the matter is that the Internet is the real world, you know, we're all people behind those. Yeah, handles. there's no division. There's no real world digital world. I mean, it's it's a major part of how we spend our time. Yeah, I you know, I think Queer Design Club is as valuable and real a community for me as um, you know, any of the people that I hang out with in the physical world. Yeah. And so it's really just about acknowledging that you've harmed someone. And maybe you don't you haven't considered it that way before, um, because it's happening in a digital media. But if you do, and if you take accountability for that, if you, you're responsible and, and you make amends, there's absolutely room for growth, I think. Yeah. So um, so what are your, uh, and I, I don't even know if you have really super articulated aspirations at this point, but how do you hope the existence of Queer Design Club changes the world <laughs> for the better? I, yeah, we've had enough of the other kind of changing the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I always think it's funny that, you know, uh, design is a bit of a monkey's paw situation. You know, we said design can change the world and we really and should have did. specified. Yeah, boy, howdy. Uh, should, have, should have been clearer on that one. I think that if Queer Design Club changes the world, I want it to be through changing individual people's lives. Uh, that's that's where I'm at right now. I don't 
myself see this becoming a nonprofit. If it, mm-hmm. you know, if it does, if it becomes a larger organization or a larger movement under different leadership, <laughs> I think I will be really moved and happy and supportive of that. What I'm trying to do is build a community of people that strengthens each other and create some possibility where there currently isn't any. So in our community, we have a young designer who's trans and uh, is was recently job hunting in San Francisco and uh, had a re- series of really good interviews that went radio silent. And he found out uh, from one of the art directors that had been on his interview panel that it was because he was trans. Oh. Basically, the creative director just wasn't comfortable, you know, didn't know if he would be a culture fit. And oh, that's so he still didn't get the job. Phrase. Still? Wait, and, oh, of course. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the, I know. yeah. I know. I- And so, Uh, you know, I want one designers like that to have support. mm -hmm. I want them to be able to connect to trans designers who are further in their career and get the advice they need to navigate those situations. And, you know, then if I do a really good job as a stretch goal, I want to change the industry and get people like that either educated or removed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. One of the interesting things about the AIGA survey results is that once a person in design reaches about five years of experience, five to 10 years, all of the indicators level out. They start hmm. making the same amount of money. They start feeling about more secure, but they have to make it those five to 10 years. And so for me, that's where I'm focused right now mm-hmm. is how can we create a space where LGBTQ designers have the support they need to stick with it? And once they do, they can start taking on leadership and they can lead the next wave of young designers from the queer community. What advice do you have for people in those first five years? Are there situations they should avoid, situations they should try to get into? (sighs) Looking back at my own career, I was really intentional to not work with people that I didn't like. (laughs) That's good. That's good advice all around. Right. That, you know, that, that comes from a, you know, a certain place of privilege. Sometimes you, you don't get that much of a choice, but I think that if you articulate who you are and you stay true to that, it creates an environment where the people who aren't going to be okay with that, who aren't going to help you become more of that, a better version of yourself, filter themselves out. Um, I, I've called it a, a path of selective self-sabotage. And it's worked really well for me. But I think what's more important is to find a community who can help you find what's right for you. Because my experience served me well, I may be the only person who benefits from this this approach to things. So I think that, you know, if you're a young designer, it's really important for you to reach out and make connections and build community um, so you can get multiple perspectives, so you can have lots of advice. Um, I think one of the things that I wish I had done when I was a younger designer, you know, feeling out my way in the world was just invite people to coffee. This is, you know, extremely... Uh, basic advice. Everyone always says, you know, just, just, you know, email someone you admire and ask them if you can take them out to coffee. And just don't say pick your brain. Yeah. Don't say pick your brain. Um, don't pitch them a startup. Don't ask them for a portfolio review. But I've definitely taken people up on those coffee offers. People and love giving advice. People really like to feel smart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People really like to feel smart and if the designer you admire is a really good designer, they want to leave the industry in a better shape than they found it. And I think that working with newer designers, giving them your perspective is a great way to do that. So I guess, I mean, if you're a queer designer in the San Francisco area and you want to grab coffee, (laughs) you know, I love lattes. So you're, John, you're on Twitter. Yeah, too much. we 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 were both off Twitter for a while. Yeah. And I got to say, it felt pretty good mentally. I did not mind it. Yeah. 
I mean, the reason I bring this up is, I mean, it's a garbage fire. And I mean, we can just, we can get very specific here about like what you would call design Twitter. Yeah. Well, you're very active. You're very active. I'm very active Twitter. on design Twitter. Every time a logo comes out, I feel the need to uh, stifle an opinion lest I get called out for having an opinion on a new logo on design Twitter. So, oh um, I mean, I say something, I get shit. Right. Which, you know, I totally expect and, and almost ask for. Uh, some No, I just straight up ask for it. As a queer designer, is it worse? Like, how do you how do you manage that? Like, or or am I just making shit up? I don't know if enough people know who I am for things to be bad for me. This podcast will change all of that. I know. Yeah. S- send me your hate DMs. No, I I thrive on hate tweets. I love getting into fights. No, I mean every once in a while I'll I'll tweet something political or queer, and you know somebody with an eagle avatar or um, something like that will pop up in my mentions to tell me how wrong I am about everything. And, you know, that's sort of par for the course. I think that when you, you know, put yourself out in public, that comes with the public who is largely terrible. Those people are easy though. Like the Eagle people and the MAGA people and, and, and the Christian freaks, they're easy. I mean, you just mute them and off they go. I think that the more dangerous one and the one that I'm hoping we we can, like if I were a good interviewer, I could get us there quicker. The people in your, in, the people in our own industry who have like bullshit libertarian ways of talking out against like diversity and inclusion. Yeah. I mean, they've spent their, their whole lives behind a computer screen and the first thing they do when they get a public platform is to show their whole ass. It's really unfortunate. I think that's actually one of the things that depresses me most about Twitter is, you know, that it really makes me confront the fact that diversity and inclusion and just generally being decent human beings is still up for debate in our industry. Yeah. And I think in some ways it's gotten worse because, you know, I've, I've, been here and been in this industry for, for this industry for a long time and what quote unquote this industry was has changed and i think getting like having it be so dominated by venture funded startups which it wasn't always has really changed things because i think you do get this finance bro monoculture and so i think a lot of people when they're like oh but you know, all these companies are based in the Bay Area. Aren't you like super liberal and inclusive? And I think there's still this cognitive dissonance where there's an idea that just because a company is based here and a company is a tech company and they're forward thinking, like they're not a legacy company. But I think I think it's exactly right to talk about people with really like lib- libertarian is too generous, I think, because it ascribes a a thoughtful political ideology to well, you told me I couldn't use the C word on the air anymore. <laughs> what, uh, what John mentioned before is, is that I've got mine attitude and I really think, and we're seeing this right now with we work like right at this moment where the, the CEO totally essentially committed fraud, took a billion dollars and they can't even lay people off until they have enough money to lay people off. And so, so I love like calling that out. The fact that you're calling it out and saying, like, just because you're this kind of company, like, and finding these stories of what's really going on and helping people to change that, to really make it more inclusive, because digital design really is creating the future. And so if the people engaged in that work aren't cool and inclusive and curious about each other and empathetic, then the kind of world that we're going to create with those software tools is terrible. Yeah, I mean, I think that it really gets to the heart of the difference between diversity and inclusion. People Mm -hmm. like to get out and look decent and say the right thing and- Take the right company photo. (laughs) Sure, yeah. Uh, Diversity at Dropbox. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, Wow. Yeah. Call back. (laughs) let's, Let's remind our listeners- uh, yeah, it was just a tweet from, I think, 2016. We'll post a link to that tweet. Yeah, from the official Dropbox account said diversity at Dropbox. And it was 
a couple white ladies, a white gay guy, and I think um, one one Asian woman. Yeah. I think so. And you know, it's it's that difference between espousing the right values and mm-hmm. doing the work. Yeah. And I think that we've gotten to a place where there's broad support for the idea. But anytime you confront someone with the work they have to do to realize it, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of pushback. Yeah, because I think a lot of that work is ceding power and making space for other voices. And if you're somebody with privilege, like I think I think there's a myth. There's a myth that, oh, nobody has to give anything up. But you know what? If you have a lot, you actually do have to give. I mean, you're still going to have a lot. You're still going to have a ton of you know, if you've got like credibility or a voice or privilege, like giving some of that up, you're still going to like have a lot. But I think that still feels like, wait a second, why do I have to, why is my work being quiet and listening? That doesn't feel like work. People want to do visible work. And I think in a lot of cases, the most important work to be done is the people with the most power have to be quiet and listen. Yeah. And I think in addition to this myth that nothing needs to change. Like you don't need to give anything up. There's also a myth that equity and inclusion means, okay, this, this person over here can have everything that I have. They can, you know, have the job that I have, the role that I have, the career that I have. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, we don't want that. We want to have our own careers. We want to be Mm -hmm. ourselves in these roles. So, part of diversity and inclusion means like making space for all of these communities in our industry without requiring them to assimilate and mm-hmm. act just like us it's not inclusive if you know you're still making people pass a culture fit test and ignoring what they look like mm-hmm. right you also actually have to include people from you know, different backgrounds who have different perspectives on life and, Mm -hmm. you know, come from different cultures and and respect and honor that and create space for that. I think that's, that's a lot of the challenge is it's not, it's not just enough to do the same thing we've always been doing with more people and more types of people. We actually have to reconsider the way we're doing things. And, And let me play the business card. If you're making shit that people all over the world are going to use, it should be made by a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different viewpoints because they're going to because all of those people working together are going to find shit that that a bunch of chads aren't going to find by themselves yeah one of the really common experiences of queer designers that we're hearing about uh through the count is having to point out that something is exclusionary based on gender or sexual orientation so you know the gender field that is man or woman, binary. Or maybe if the company is truly progressive, man, woman, or other. Or, you know, the thing that gets under my skin the most is iconography and illustration Mm -hmm. for things like family or household. So Rinse was one of them. I was signing up for Rinse a couple months ago. And it was like, are you signing up as an individual and had a little egg-shaped avatar or a family? And it was a little egg-shaped avatar with a tie next to an egg-shaped avatar with, you know, long hair and a tiny egg-shaped avatar. To be fair, Guff is very egg-shaped. Yes, my dog (laughs) is very (laughs) egg-shaped. But that's not what a family looks like for me. And... Uh, Uh, Banks are the worst. Banks, bank stock photography is so, so deeply heteronormative. Yeah. Why go near that? Why go near that at all? Because it's easy. Yeah. I, you know, I think, <laughs> I think that that's something that a lot of cisgender heterosexual people haven't accepted. Your experiences are really easy compared to people who don't fit that descriptor. And so that imagery is easy to lean on. It's a lot harder to design something that speaks to family or relationships um, at a conceptual level. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to create a gender field that provides usable data in the rare cases where you need data about gender. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, I, I want to bear down on that point right yeah. there. Why the fuck are you asking about it? Because most of the companies asking about that have absolutely no reason to be asking for that data. 
And I mean, it t- for fuck's sake, take the lazy choice. Don't ask for it. And yeah. you've avoided a nightmare. But they they want to use it to target ads for unnecessarily gendered products. Right. If I don't if I don't tell Facebook I'm a man, uh, how am I going to get um, your barbecue or or my uh, dude wipes? Oh, oh God, <laughs> why why did you have to alert me to that? Or your man man Kleenex, which are my favorite, the man size Kleenex. Oh no, they're my favorite. I well, lo- to be fair, men's tears are bigger. <laughs> and there's they, so and they many flow of them. more freely. Yes, yeah, especially and they're lately. also delicious. <laughs> yeah, I think I was in a, a cab once where the the screen, the seatback screen, asked me my gender so I could get a gender targeted experience. And that makes me extremely angry. Why the fuck angry. do you want a gender targeted experience in a cab? I absolutely do not want a gender targeted experience. Let me tell you, across the fucking board, I do not want a gender targeted experience. Well, it's like um, I tell Etsy I'm a man, and now every Valentine's Day I get emails about what to get her. And my partner is named Lori, but Lori has a penis. <laughs> my partner is named Lori, but Lori is a man, you know. I, 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 there's all sorts of assumptions that go into asking for gender and, and, um, you know, sexuality is, is one of them. We start to, you know, we think we can infer who you're dating or who you're loving based on a single field. It's not accurate. Yeah. Or all these other life things, like the the number of assumptions that people make are terrible. And what I don't get, like you, you talked about it being so much easier, the whole reason to be a designer, like the whole reason I find the field interesting is you learn new things, like m- meet cool people and solve hard problems. And why don't you want to, to really solve the problem? And uh and I know part of it is, again, that like these these companies are just becoming machines for redistributing capital. And that's kind of they're not really solving the problem problem. It's not really redis- redistributing well, it's from, anything. Yeah. It's, yeah. Anyway. Anyway. But uh, but I would think uh, I would hope I would hope because, again, we're talking about lowering our expectations for the general public. But I would hope that uh, designers and technologists would like welcome uh, the challenge to say like, okay, bring me the information. Cause I, I do want to do the difficult thing. I do want to do the right thing. And I do want my eyes opened to, Oh, I have been super lazy and now I have an opportunity to do better than I did in the past. It's one of the most rewarding things about the career. I think, uh, I'm really fortunate in that my first real design job, uh, was at an LGBTQ nonprofit in Boston called Fenway health. Um, and Fenway serves a really diverse community. Um, it, do, it operates community health centers, but it also does HIV AIDS education and outreach, um, trans health services. And so I got to work with a lot of people who are very different from me and whose experiences were very different from my own early in my career. I was mostly doing things like posters and, and postcards, um, and, you know, single page websites, Mm -hmm. but it was for audiences who had unique perspectives from my own. And I got to work with people from those communities to make it happen. And that was an amazing opportunity. And one of the, one of the most rewarding moments of my career, you know, to this day is, uh, working with a program coordinator from, uh, Fenway's youth health center who worked on their trans programming, um, having a conversation about some marketing we were going to design for him. And he said, oh, it sounds like you kind of get it. (laughs) And that was um, a huge moment for me because I can't say that at the beginning of my working there that I did. I wouldn't be so... uh, arrogant to suggest that I do now. But, mm-hmm. you know, in that moment, in my role as a designer, this client from a community who needed my services felt heard mm-hmm. through my work. And that was really powerful. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'll say that that's always been like the thing that, that we've found in our client work, the most rewarding when we work with, uh, with people and they say like, you really, you heard us, you understood us like that. It's not about just making something really cool or beautiful because that's great if you can do that. But it's the fact that you had a connection with these people and really helped them and, and, and didn't just impose like your worldview on them. And, and getting a sense from people about how little that actually happens, where yeah. they feel like somebody's listening and hearing yeah. what they have to say is kind of heartbreaking. Well, that was also one of the more challenging things in that role is that when you are working with people from different backgrounds and different experiences, there is also a different set of standards for mm -hmm. usability and 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 aesthetics. So I was working, for instance, on marketing for a program targeting trans women and talking to some of the people involved in this program about what this marketing should feel and look like for them. And honestly, I was I thought, oh, this is really tacky. You know, they wanted it to feel like sort of a lifestyle brand, like a Victoria's Secret. Because, you know, the feeling that they got in this group was, you know, hanging out with girlfriends and, you know, having these fun conversations, even though the purpose of the group was to build community and reduce mm -hmm. HIV risk. And I, I really struggled. I thought, oh, this is going to be bad design. And it wasn't until it was live and I saw how successful it was and they reached out to me to tell me how much they and the other participants, the new participants, enjoyed the marketing material and how it made them feel that I realized, oh, this is great design. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is successful. This is, you yeah. know, who it's for. And I think that that's going to be a real turning point um, for the industry in terms of inclusion is that inviting in different perspectives and, and serving different people is also going to mean being more thoughtful about how mm -hmm. we evaluate the quality of our work. I think that, you know, like for the longest time we've, we've held that good design is, is Swiss design. And, you know, it's, it's that like beautifully framed right. AIGA poster. And one of the things that's really great about being involved with the queer design community is that there's a lot of work that's like really messy and challenging that comes from LGBT people. And it's still really beautiful and exciting to see. We have to care more about the impact yeah. than, than the aesthetics mm -hmm. of the work. Well, also, I think we have to care more about reaching people instead of target markets. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. yeah of course. Um, I think I love aesthetics. I love the look and feel of things beyond the functionality. But I think that being inclusive in who we serve also means that uh, our work is going to get more diverse in terms of how it looks and how it works, well, which is I, really exciting. I love it when something appeals to me. That's, you know, the job of aesthetics. And I have an aesthetic and, and things appeal to me. And I'm a privileged asshole where most of the things in the world are meant to appeal to me. And now imagine if you never had that feeling. Imagine if nothing out there appealed to you because nothing was designed for you. That's got to suck. And beyond that, the things that you find every once in a great moon that do appeal to you, that do remind you of the visual culture that you grew up in or is meaningful to you is labeled bad design. Yeah. So not only <laughs> is nothing made for you um, by the establishment, you are belittled for liking the things that you do or for having the visual culture that you have. I, you know, I definitely still struggle with that. You know, I have my perspective about like what I like and how things should look. And, you know, one of the amazing things about being engaged in communities is it gives you the opportunity to like shut up and listen and take, take things in and appreciate other people's perspectives. And it's really opened my eyes to, you know, not just, the human experience, but also different possibilities within design, you know, the really important stuff. Yep. One, one of the greatest threads recently on Twitter about design was of uh, concept designs for wheelchairs. 
Oh my God. Did you see that one? Yeah, disability dongles. Yeah, and people who actually use wheelchairs were presenting these for discussion. Uh, and the designs just, they had this, many of them had a strange future aesthetic and in no way accommodated the practical realities of using a chair in your daily life. I mean, they were absurd. There was yeah. like no place for the feet or there were the the best one. I think there was more than one where your able friend could ride on your chair with right. you. Yay! And it's like, and they were like, how do you get on the damn bus with this thing? Yeah. Like, like yeah. race cars that couldn't fit through a door. My, uh, my personal favorite, the one that um, really just sort of, shook me out of my own perspective was this really beautiful minimalist one um, that had, I think, wood paneling. And the comment was, because who doesn't like feeling like a piece of furniture? And I was like, oh, oh wow. shit, yeah. You know, like, yeah, this, I love mid-century modern. This is great. Sign me up. And there's just a completely different emotional experience that goes along with that if you're actually living with disability. So what what I'll say is um, is one of the big pitfalls for well-meaning designers, I think, is wanting to solve the whole problem. Like there's that ego trap, and this happens. Like this happens oh, in so much of this philanthropy and NGOs as well, where you want to come in and you're like, "Oh, you people are suffering. I I'm going to bring you the solution. I'm not going to look." at the community to see how people are already solving these problems and, and amplify those solutions or, or imp help improve them. It's like you want to come in as a designer with your genius brain and not work in collaboration or in conversation with people in a community. You just want to come in and be like, oh, I brought you this. And I think that's where a lot of those wheelchair designs came from is like, oh, look, oh, you're, you're so sad and pathetic here. I'm bringing you something so much cooler. Yeah. So um, I saw that wheelchair thread, I think, um, from Liz Jackson, who's at Elise Jackson on Twitter. And she talks a lot about these uh, speculative designs uh, for disability or for people with disabilities that clearly center the abled, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's the wheelchair that your friend can ride. Yeah. You know, because you are a beast of burden. Yeah. Or the wheelchair that, that makes you as a person who doesn't use a, a wheelchair feel less bad for somebody or they fit into the, your decor, like right. the mid-century modern chair. It's like, oh, my my friend fits in with the rest of my chairs. Oh, I can invite them to dinner now. Like, it's it's so terrible. But we do want to give the straights a biscuit. How can they support the LGBTQIA people they might be working with without making them do extra work to explain themselves or make the person feel better. Yeah, I think what being a good ally looks like is different depending on the situation and, you know, your relationship with the people in your life and, you know, what your own circumstances are. I think you know, the most important thing is listen and we get into a situation sometimes where we have to listen and hear uncomfortable truths about the way we've been in the world or the way we've assumed the world has been, and we want to argue them. And listen and trust the LGBTQ people in your life and do your own work, right? I think when people want to be better, the first instinct is to go to someone that they feel safe with and, and be like, tell me all about the queer community and the queer experience. And Google is right there and it's free and you can ask it anything you want. It can be really uncomfortable to have that level of conversation, even with people that you really care about and know. You know, the other thing is give us money, right? Like donate to queer causes, hire us. Uh, make sure that, you know, if you're in a position to staff a role that you are reaching outside of your own network and making sure that your pipeline is diverse. I think that diverse companies and diverse employees come from a diverse candidate pool. And so, you know, if you want to be a good ally in the tech industry, you know, go to Queer Design Club uh, or go to Blacks Who Design and make sure that you're actually reaching out to people outside of your network 
um, and letting them know about opportunities that are there. And then once you've hired somebody, let them do the job that you hired them for. Let them do the job that you hired them for. Don't make them your your unpaid DNI specialist. Oh, that right? I've heard that happen from what's, so many people. What's DNI? Uh, diversity and inclusion. Thank so you. it's not DNR. Yeah, it's totally different. Oh no, I've tattooed the wrong thing on my chest. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, it's the queer tax or or the black tax. Like mm -hmm. I've I've started at this company that is predominantly, you know, white and straight or cis. And now it's also my extra unpaid job to teach everybody how to be or inclusive. to run events or to run events after hours or, or to, to be, go to events and do recruiting or to be in every job interview. Yeah, right. Or in every photo on the website. Um, uh, you know, you find yourself in a tweet about diversity that gets roasted three years later. It's <laughs> yeah. I, if you want to be inclusive, there's a lot of work behind that. There are a bunch of companies, uh, and organizations dedicated to helping you do it. Pay those companies mm -hmm. to do that work, to help you do that work. Don't lean on your marginalized employees to do it. Who have a day job a working day job. for you doing their job. Right. If they wanted to be diversity and inclusion consultants, they would have applied for that role. Because mm -hmm. if you're a tech company in San Francisco, you probably have it open already. Yeah. And of, of a friend who works at a very large company who was telling me, and I'm going to fudge some of the details here. Uh, they had like a diversity and inclusion week where over 50% of the events were about allies and it ended with a, a party to celebrate allies. Yeah. Well, if you don't have any queer people or people of color, you, you have to celebrate the allies. <laughs> <laughs> but she said there were like three black people in the corner of the party just saying, they're just throwing a party for themselves. God damn it. They found a way to make it about themselves. Yeah. White people are really good at that. Yeah. Anyway, we got to wrap up. John, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me, Mike. And let me just say, hey, Erica. let me just say, I've known you for a while now. I had the pleasure of working with you here at Mule. Uh, and that was a blast. So good at what you do. But then... And and then watching you go out there and do things like the Queer Design Club and just be fearless in all of this stuff that you're starting and saying and doing and standing up for yourself and standing up for others, it is an honor to watch. Thank you Thank so much, you. Mike. Thank you for everything you do. John, you are an inspiration. Really oh, my is. God. I am OK at best. Um, but you know, thank you so much. I, I think that, you know, my time at Mule really set me up with an understanding of what it could mean to be a designer and what the responsibility that comes along with that really is. And so I am very happy to be carrying that forward. And I, I hope that everyone listening does the same in whatever way resonates with them. All I ever do is encourage people's loud behavior. Yeah. Be loud. Be loud. Flip a table. <laughs> They'll make more. <laughs> All right, we're out of here. Once again, please sign up for the Queer Design Club count. Get your voice heard. And that is at queerdesign.club slash count. Thank you. And we will be back in a couple of weeks. Is, is there any... Boiler room work that we have to do here. Anything we want to announce? Anything that we want? No, your book like, is out. Jesus uh, Christ, your book is out. Oh my God. Yeah. Your book. Do, do we have any, any gratuitous self promotion we've got to do? I mean, we kind of did that on the, on the last one. How we do it all the time. I know. Good. So the second, so I'll, I'll toot your horn. Uh, the second edition, Awkward. is it? Just enough research. The second edition. Out now. It's out now. And and it's like two thirds. It's like 23% 20, thicker. 23% thicker. As, as 23%. Am I. <laughs> 23% more orange. Yeah. Yeah. And there's uh, way more centaurs. 
And there's a new picture of the dog in the back. There is a new picture of the dog. Saltier than the old picture of the dog. Rupert is also 23% thicker. Yes. Than when the last photo was taken. The fun joke. Okay. I love that joke. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to The Voice of Design. You can find us on Twitter at VOD Rocks, V O D underscore R O C K S. Tell all of your friends and colleagues to listen. And if you are so moved, rate us on any, really any place you can rate podcasts. And we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Goodbye.